Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Peter Lee. Peter uh, is my boss, but he's also the worldwide head of uh, Microsoft Research. So as such, he's responsible for all of Microsoft Research, which is 13 organizations, different parts of the world. Uh, Peter uh, used to be a professor at Carnegie Mellon, head of the department. Uh, his area is programming languages, and uh, he was also a, pr a program manager in DARPA, and has a wide sort of experience in leading research from different perspectives. But, you know, without further ado, Peter. So, uh, thank you. Wow, this is, um, I feel like I'm commanding a battleship uh, here, so it's good. Uh, so um, I, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and um, I didn't think too much about what I wanted to say, but um, I thought um, the only thing I could do uh, maybe is tell you a little bit about um, why I think computing research is so important and such uh, an exciting uh, thing to do right now, especially right now. Um, the only instructions I was given um, were just to be uh, inspiring and hopefully humorous, and I don't know if I can do either of those things. So, so but I'll at least try to fill the time, and then hopefully, um, uh, if you have questions, uh, be open to taking some questions. Um, so, um, as um, Anandan mentioned, um, I uh, run Microsoft Research, and I'll tell you a little bit more a little bit about Microsoft Research um, in some detail a little bit later. But uh, for the moment, um, the only thing to realize is that Microsoft Research is a, is a research, basic computing research lab um, housed within Microsoft. Um, and I've been there for four years. And before Microsoft Research, I was at uh, a government agency, uh, part of the Department of Defense in the US called DARPA. And um, I was there for uh, just about two years, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. And before that, I was a professor of computer science at Carnegie Mellon University, and, uh, and in the end, the head of computer science at Carnegie Mellon. Um, and then, finally, before that, uh, of course, I was a student. And um, I was a student um, growing up. Uh, you can tell I'm Asian. I'm Korean by heritage. I was born in the U.S., but um, Korean. My mother and father um, immigrated from Korea to the U.S., um, and then I was born. Um, and my father um, was a physics professor and mother a chemistry professor. Okay. So I want you to imagine, I think it's probably the same in India as it is in the U.S., um, but Asian household, physics professor for father, chemistry professor for mother, there was never any possibility that I would be anything but a scientist of some kind. <laughs> and so, um, and I think particularly um, I grew up in a small town in the U.S. That, where there were very few Asians, and so I was very, very much destined to do this. And so, in fact, I um, studied hard. Um, I did well in high school and then went to college and s started off majoring in physics. Now, before I went to uh, college, though, um, in high school, I went to summer camps. And uh, one of the summer camps that was most informative in high school was um, an early summer camp on computer programming. And this was very early days, 1975, uh, very early days. And I was exposed to computer programming, and I just loved it. it I just found it completely captivating. And I, even then in high school, I thought maybe I would want to study computers uh, when I went to college someday. And my parents made it very clear to me that computers were not a legitimate field of study. You know, that computers were only a tool for the true intellectual pursuits of physics, mathematics, and chemistry. And so when I went to college, um, I s started off majoring in physics. And um, I advanced very rapidly through some courses in my freshman year. In my sophomore year, I hit 
thermodynamics and uh, realized that that was much too difficult. And so at a great disappointment to my parents, I switched my major from physics to math and, um, and became a math student. Um, now, as I um, progressed and completed my math degree, um, I finished um, my undergraduate degree in math, but I never really lost my attraction to computing. And um, in between my junior and senior years in college, um, I started to do some undergraduate projects with a professor at Michigan. His name is Uwe Pleban. And Uwe was doing this work on a field of computer science that you may or may not be familiar with uh, called formal semantics. Um, and he introduced me to the work of a number of people, um, but most importantly for me, the work of Dana Scott and Christopher Strachey on something, uh, some work they had done in the 60s called uh, denotational semantics. And what was very important for me then was um, a kind of a thought process where um, the, um, uh, you know, where there was a, a sense of understanding, is there something unique in computer science that really defines it as a new legitimate pursuit in this kind of pushing out the frontiers of human knowledge? And so uh, one simple kind of equation I'll write here. Okay, and so now, uh, of course, all of us in this room, I, I believe you're all computer science students of one form or another, computer science, computer engineering, maybe some mathematicians here. Um, but, uh, of course, in our modern world today, uh, any computer science or engineering student in instantly recognizes this as a program. Um, and, in fact, the program to compute factorials. So provide uh, this program um, a value, a natural number for n, and you will get its factorial. Um, but as a mathematician, as a mathematics student, particularly a mathematics student prior to the birth of computer science and prior to the birth of denotational semantics, this is not a program. This is simply uh, an equation. And in fact, to most, most mathematicians in the time, particularly in the 70s and before then, it's a statement of a problem. Solve for f. And so, no big deal. It is just math. There's nothing new in computer science. That's the prevailing view of the time. And so now, we can imagine if we have God's factorial function handed to us and we plug that value uh, into f, then the equation holds. And so, a uh, first impulse uh, for any mathematician, any physicist, any chemist, of that time is that there is nothing special about computer science. You know, it, 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 it's just a special case of mathematics. Now, the thing that was interesting about, um, about Dana Scott's work is um, that he imagined other equations. So instead of writing this equation, let's replace this term with f of n plus 1 divided by n. And so now, um, again, all of us as computer scientists immediately see that this is not a program, you know, that this will not compute anything sensible. However, as a mathematician, again, if we're given God's factorial function and we plug the, the God's factorial function in for f on both sides, the equation still holds. And so when I first saw this, and this was in one of Dana Scott's early papers, I immediately understood, it may call me strange, but at least, remember, I was really focused on mathematics and physics. I immediately understood, oh my God, this is something 
the idea of computation of computable functions is something that no mathematics, no, no known mathematics, no classical mathematics could explain. And so for me, as this young student, uh, it finally allowed me to break free of the expectations of my mother and father and understand that there was something very deep and new uh, and possibly important in the study of computer science. So I don't know if this makes sense to anyone, but this is uh, really how I gained myself the courage to leave behind uh, physics and math and, and go into computer science. Is there yes. a theory of recursively computable functions? Yes. So, um, in fact, one reason why Dana Scott won the Turing Award is he developed uh, a new form of mathematics, a domain theory um, that's based on um, lattice structures that is capable of explaining um, uh, that is capable of explaining computable functions in a very, very precise way. And so, it was something that really made um, a tremendous impact for me. And so I went to graduate school as a result of this and um, wrote a PhD thesis uh, on d in the area of denotational semantics and type theory. And so it was fairly theoretical. Um, and, um, and after I finished my PhD, um, I wrote a fairly good thesis. Um, during my PhD studies, Dana Scott, uh, who had been at Oxford University, um, came to the U.S. and joined the faculty at Carnegie Mellon University. And so I finished my PhD, and um, I went to Carnegie Mellon and joined the faculty uh, in Dana Scott's group um, and, uh, and continued to do work like this. So now uh, uh, two or three years pass, and um, the department head who had hired me at Carnegie Mellon, uh, Nico Haberman, who was a, really a great man at the time, um, he uh, unfortunately passed away suddenly from a heart attack. And a new department head took over. And um, uh, his name is Jim Morris. And Jim and I, after several years, became very close friends. Um, but uh, at that time, when he took over being department head, uh, Jim didn't know me very well. I didn't really know him. And so as a new department head, he had set up a series of one-on-one -on -one meetings with each faculty member. And so, so I had my meeting with him. And I was just in my third year, I think, so I didn't have tenure. And he asked me what kind of research I do. And so I explained all of this. And, um, and Jim did not understand why this was at all interesting. And, um, and he said, you know, Peter, why are you doing this kind of research? What possible use could it have in this world? And of course, you know, I'm a very young professor, and so I say back to my new department head, well, it's just so beautiful. And um, I still remember this. Um, he said back to me, well, if all you're interested in is beauty, maybe you should be a professor in the fine arts school instead of in computer science. And, um, and I was, you know, of course, you know, didn't feel very good about that. But I tell these two stories because one thing that happens for research, and I think one of the things that I'm hoping to impart <coughs> in uh, all of you today, is that one of the powerful things about research is developing a devotion to a certain set of ideas, technical ideas, and really trying to understand them deeply, even in the face of external doubts. In my case, doubts from parents, doubts from a department head, um, but still understanding that the pursuit of these ideas uh, it can be very important. And for me, I feel completely vindicated because many of the ideas that I've been studying at the time um, that uh, in, in the formal semantics, denotational semantics, operational semantics, type theory, all have had direct application in program analysis and verification techniques that today, for example, in Microsoft, are really fundamental in the way that Microsoft develops its products. For example, for Windows and Office um, today, operational semantics and type theory are fundamental in uh, doing the validation of, 
of Windows and Office to eliminate as many security uh, bugs as possible. And so it has just become such a practical thing. And one of the wonderful things about computer science research is that oftentimes the most beautiful ideas that we conceive of um, also end up being the most practical and most compelling uh, in the real world. And this kind of combination of really beautiful theory uh, and valuable practice is something that comes up over and over again uh, in, in computing research. So anyway, so um, over time I um, developed my research program at Carnegie Mellon and um, after 20 years as a professor I became head of computer science at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, did that for about three years. Um, and then in 2009, uh, well in 2008, um, the United States um, elected a new president, um, uh, Barack Obama. And um, of the many reforms that the new president wanted to affect in the country, um, one had to do with this agency called DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. And um, DARPA, uh, I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with it. DARPA in the US at least is a very famous uh, research agency. Um, DARPA was formed, and when it was originally formed, it was formed um, in 1954, I think. Um, it was called ARPA, the Advanced Research Projects Agency. And it was formed um, because the Soviets surprised the United States by launching Sputnik. And so the successful launch of the first kind of satellite immediately crystallized for the US Defense Department the possibility that space might be the next frontier for future warfare and that the Soviets were ahead. But what was most shocking for the US was the complete surprise. There was no warning that the Soviets were, uh, were about to do this. And so ARPA was formed, I think, in 1954 uh, with the sole mission to prevent technological surprise in the future. And so many famous things were created by ARPA. One of the most famous um, was uh, the ARPANET, which later became the foundation of the internet. Um, the whole field of material science um, was created uh, out of an ARPA program and really has had worldwide impact. Um, the, uh, uh, all the fundamental technology and the concept of GPS, Global Positioning System, was developed. Um, and then several military um, kinds of systems like stealth technologies also. So it's, uh, within the US it's a famous agency. And in computer science, uh, DARPA has had a very long uh, history of influence in many fields of computer science, in software engineering, artificial intelligence, many subfields of artificial intelligence in robotics, speech, vision, and so on. Um, and Anandan and I both uh, uh, benefited a lot from, from DARPA programs. Um, well, in 9-11, uh, 2001, um, there was, of course, a terrible terrorist attack that took down the World Trade Centers in uh, in New York, and President Bush at the time redirected DARPA to uh, focus all of its effort on the war on terrors, on terrorists. And in that process, a lot of the f kind of fundamental research programs in DARPA were shut down. And in fact, most of the core computer science programs at DARPA were shut down. And so from 2001, to 2008, DARPA really lost a lot, a lot of its power in, in basic research. And so when Obama was elected in 2008, one of the things he wanted to do was restore DARPA to its former self. And so I was lucky enough to be invited to be part of reforming DARPA, and, um, and so I went there in 2009. Uh, to, to work on this, and it was uh, personally very difficult um, because, you know, I was uh, working as a department head at a very good computer science department at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, my wife and son didn't want to move. In fact, didn't move from Pittsburgh, so this meant I would have to live away from my wife and son there. But I felt it was important enough to go, so I went. 
So I went 2009 uh, summer, and when I went to DARPA, um, one of the things that was going on uh, were a lot of celebrations because 2009 turned out to be the 40th anniversary of two major technical achievements in the United States. So 40 years prior to 2009, in 1969, two things happened. One is the U.S. put a man on the moon uh, with the Apollo program. And at DARPA, this was important because the large booster rocket called the Saturn V booster was the very first project at DARPA. And so there was a lot of celebration and a lot of pride at DARPA uh, to celebrate the 40th anniversary of putting a man on the moon, uh, which involved the Saturn V booster uh, developed at DARPA. Um, and the second thing that happened in 1969 um, was something called the mother, uh, was the creation of the ARPANET. So in the summer of 2009, the first two nodes of the ARPANET were demonstrated. There was uh, one node at Stanford Research Institute, one node at uh, UCLA, and there was an attempt to send the word login, the message login from UCLA to SRI, and the letters L and O got transmitted and received properly, and then there was a buffer overflow, the very first buffer overflow. Uh, in, in the internet uh, happened, uh, that first demonstration. And then later in December, two additional nodes um, were added. So there were four nodes to the ARPANET. Um, and importantly, there was uh, something called the mother of all demos that year, where um, a uh, demonstration was shown how two people far apart, one person in Utah, one person in, in Palo Alto, were able to use the ARPANET to collaborate on the writing of a document together. And so the idea that this network could augment human intelligence and collaboration uh, was really demonstrated for the first time in 1969. So these two major events in 1969 were being celebrated in 2009 at, at DARPA because DARPA really played a central role in, the, uh, in these two major achievements. In fact, some people believe that 1969 was the greatest year for technical achievement in the United States, in the US history. And so it was really quite amazing. So now, uh, one rhetorical question that I've asked many people is, of these two events, putting a man on the moon and creating the ARPANET, both happening in 1969, which of these two events had bigger impact on the world? ARPANET? And why? Why the ARPANET? The world got connected. And, and that's exactly right. The world got connected, which means almost all the people had access to this powerful technology. And so one of the things that is just incredible about computers and computer science and computing research and networking is the ability that we have to democratize access to this technology. And the way I put it, actually, I was talking to the Secretary of Defense at the time, um, Secretary Gates, and I said, my son, I have a 17-year-old son, um, at, the t at that time, of course, he was younger, he has never used Saturn V booster rocket technology to, to reinforce his math studies. And, uh, and so the ability uh, for almost every person in the world to have access to something powerful like the ARPANET or the internet, what it does, it not only connects the world, but it also almost guarantees a steady stream of disruptive innovations. And that is really the defining feature today of computer science, <coughs> computer engineering, and of the whole information technology industry. And so it just, to my mind, nothing in this era of humanity, nothing can be more exciting than to be a part of creating this new connected world. And at the very center of creating that new connected world is computing research. And if you have the mind for it, I 
honestly believe there's nothing both nobler and more exciting and probably more fun that you could be engaged with for a lifetime than computing research. And it just, just so many possibilities. When you're in a situation where these things can be democratized so widely, it's incredible. This year, it happens every year for me. This year, for example, at Microsoft Research, our new CEO, Satya Nadella, announced the availability at the end of this year of one of our projects out of Microsoft Research called the Skype Translator. And so Skype itself, which is a Microsoft product, represents the democratization of global telecommunications. And now imagine what is possible if we enable all users of Skype to cross the language barrier, to talk to anyone else in their language. How would that change the world? It's just really incredible. And all of these things are things that come out of computing research. So now let me talk a little bit uh, about Microsoft Research, because I think I'm obligated to brag about it a little bit, and then, uh, then we can take some questions. Um, so, uh, so now I work for Microsoft Research. Uh, Microsoft Research is um, a part, a division of Microsoft <coughs> that is a little bit different and is engaged in very long-term, what we call beyond the headlights research. And so uh, we try to do three things. We try to advance the field uh, we, and the state of the art. We try to improve through research uh, Microsoft's products. And three, um, we act as a kind of insurance policy for Microsoft. We're, we're like the DARPA for Microsoft. So we are there to avoid technological surprise and to create technological surprise for our competitors. And so those are the kind of three missions of MSR. Um, we're both very large and very small. We're, we have 1,100 researchers spread in 13 labs around the world. Um, one of our most important labs is here in Bangalore, uh, so this Microsoft Research India. Um, we, at the same time, are fairly small because we're less than 1% of the total workforce of Microsoft. And so it's a very interesting kind of situation where on the one hand, we're a very large and powerful research organization. On the other hand, we're within Microsoft. We're a very tiny organization. Um, we're also very young and very old. We're old because um, we were founded in 1991. And um, the only competitor of Microsoft's that still exists from 1991 to today is IBM. And all of our other competitors that existed in 1991 are, are, are long gone. And uh, MSR really has been part of the reason why Microsoft has had such uh, a long life and such staying power. At the same time, we're very young. Compared to great research universities, um, like the IISC here, um, we're only 23 years old. And most of the great research organizations around the world are much older than that. And so we're still very young, um, still an uh, organization that's maturing. Um, but hoping to become as great as some of the great universities uh, like this one. Um, in MSR, um, our researchers are free to, to choose what they believe are the most important research problems to work on. So the managers, like Anadan and I, are not allowed to tell researchers what to do. And so um, our jobs are mainly to make sure that researchers have enough resources to do their work and to hire the best researchers we can find. Uh, but otherwise not tell them what to do. Uh, and for the most part, uh, they do very interesting work, and oftentimes they do it with, in collaboration with the university researchers. And so um, it's a fun place to be. And um, I sometimes feel a little bit too far away from the actual fun research, just being a manager. Um, um, but, um, but I get close enough usually that, that I have a great time. So. With that, I thank you for listening. If you have questions or uh, anything, I'm, I'm really happy to engage in discussion. <coughs> do, do you hire any pure mathematicians? Or? Ah, yes. Do we hire? Yes, we do hire pure mathematicians. So we we are mostly computer science and engineering, but we do hire mathematicians, some biologists, um, and other types of scientists. Um, we have some very good mathematicians. Um, 
One notable mathematician is um, Michael Friedman, who's a fields medalist, a uh, very well-known topologist. And uh, he has been leading a group of mathematicians and physicists uh, in our Santa Barbara lab um, that uh, has been very focused on uh, what are called topological effects in solid-state systems. So it's combining mathematics and, um, and uh, theoretical physics. And um, that's <coughs> turned into very, very interesting, uh, very interesting work. Um, we have a number of other mathematicians that um, are more focused on uh, statistics and probability theory. Um, we have uh, several uh, people working in statistical physics. Now, there has been a long history and fascination um, with physics. Statistics in computer science has become you know, highly relevant and important. Um, we have a number of game theorists, uh, mostly with a computational bent. Uh, maybe most prominent of, of them being uh, Moshe Tenenholz, who works out of our lab in Israel. Um, and then we have, I don't think you would call these um, mathematicians necessarily, but we have a growing number of um, uh, both macro and micro economists. And, uh, and most of them have, um, uh, have a more theoretical kind of inclination to them. So Peter, actually, yeah. we have a large number of electrical engineers in this crowd. Ah, yeah. yes. So we have been uh, having more and more uh, electrical engineers and computer engineers also. Um, one thing that has become very important for Microsoft lately <coughs> Um, is a deeper understanding in the design and future frontiers in uh, all aspects of hardware, both in the data center but also in the hardware on our desks and in our pockets. Um, so some of you might have seen, for example, um, uh, that recently uh, we announced a, a deployment in our data centers of a whole new uh, data center architecture um, based on reconfigurable um, reconfigurable fabrics on FPGAs. Um, and so there was a significant amount of electrical engineering and also mechanical engineering in the design of that machinery. We do a substantial amount of networking design um, and deployment uh, around the world. And increasingly, um, there's more and more work, particularly with the acquisition of Nokia, uh, in, um, in small devices and sensors. And so the, the number of electrical and computer engineers has, <coughs> has been growing lately in, in MSR worldwide, and, and mechanical engineers as well. So. When we have these disruptive technologies, like postal, postal mail is almost becoming outdated with yes. your email and other things. So how, like, it's good to develop technologies, but if people are losing jobs, yeah. Yes. So um, this is very interesting. Um, in fact, one of the most important thinkers on this problem uh, is a researcher at Microsoft, um, Jaron Lanier. And in fact, he just published, he's published several books on, on exactly this problem. He just published this past year uh, an economics study um, entitled, Who Owns the Future? on precisely this problem. And in fact, in his economic study, he actually blames the IT industry for um, uh, a, a chronic unemployment problem and the divide between uh, rich and poor. Um, and so he has been um, very thoughtful about this. And in fact, he has just been awarded the Peace Prize of the German Book Authors Association. And, uh, the Chancellor Angela Merkel will be giving him the award this October. And so it has become a very important study uh, on this precise problem. And so um, in MSR, we have a small set of researchers. Um, it's only three. It's not many out of the 100, but three who have been looking at the, this chronic issue of the apparent concentration of wealth that occurs. It's not just only the disruption of industries that causes loss of jobs for people, but it also, I, many things in the tech industry seem to concentrate wealth in a smaller number of people. 
And so we do have some economics research that has been looking at this phenomenon. And this particular book, Who Owns the Future, was a major product of that work. So I, I can't say that we have answers uh, for this, but that's been a very, uh, that, that topic is becoming more and more important. Um, there's a, a related issue about um, privacy also, privacy concerns as things go. And some of you might know that um, Facebook has been making the news lately because they conducted a study. Right. And um, so they had about 700,000 um, users of Facebook where they had divided into three groups. Uh, one control group, a uh, second group where they used sentiment analysis on status updates and so they gave one group uh, uh, mostly positive sentiment uh, news, and then, then a third group where they gave mostly negative sentiment news. And then they ran sentiment analysis on those users' status updates. And so what they found was that the people who were fed more negative uh, news um, be themselves became slightly more negative. And so that. Um, that uh, study uh, has been quite controversial, and we have had several of our researchers who have been commenting publicly uh, on this. Jaron Lanier being one, Kate Crawford being another, um, and uh, Dana Boyd being a third. And so I think we have been really trying to be at the leading edge of these issues. But there does seem to be something uh, odd happening um, with the kind of disruptions uh, taking place here. Yes. Uh, sir, I am Udai, doing PhD in EC department in wireless communication. Ah. So, recently Microsoft acquired uh, Nokia. Yes. So, are you people are doing uh, concentrating on in 4G wireless research work? What are the domains you people are doing? I would like to know more on that. Uh -huh. Well, so the first the, the truthful answer is I would like to know more also. The, uh, so, you know, the uh, kind of merging of two large companies uh, is a very complicated affair. Um, now, having said that, um, uh, the, the networking business of Nokia was not a part of the acquisition, and the Nokia research centers were not a part of, of the acquisition. And so, um, there has been a very extensive coordination with Nokia to fill the voids for the handset business that, that we acquired with MSR. And so, um, so all aspects of wireless networking research have been of very high interest to Nokia um, in, within MSR. And so what has happened so far is uh, series of very important kind of coordination meetings between MSR research groups and uh, different parts of Nokia. And so just as a first approximation, MSR is going to try to replace the, you know, what the Nokia had been doing with their own research centers uh, in various areas, in cameras and photography, in uh, wireless, in battery technologies, and, and SOC architecture design, many other uh, materials, uh, many areas. Um, the, in terms of 4G LTE and the standards and really uh, providing the, the, um, the uh, prototype code stacks and so on for vendors around the world, uh, that is all staying um, with Nokia, the, their MSN business. And so they will maintain that. That's not a part of Microsoft. Um, and so. So what will be at Microsoft are, are hopefully with MSR's involvement, you know, are our own proprietary advancements in, in wireless networking. And, we'll um, take one more question. Yeah. Sure. And then probably you can go for your next one. Yeah. Hello, sir. Uh, uh, I'm Srikant. I'm an MS by research student uh, from Hyderabad under uh. Professor Ramurthy, sir. Uh, first of all, it's an honor and pleasure uh, talking to you, sir. Uh -huh. Sir, I want to ask you this. Uh, so how easy, it, I mean, how hard it has been for you to, uh, you know, transform yourself from a professor to somebody who has to do practical work at DARPA and again, 
moving on to Microsoft Research. So theory to practice. Yeah. Uh, I just want to ask how hard it is and how easy it is. Right. Uh, wow, that is the best question. Um, <laughs> so the um, uh, this is going to be frustrating, but it, I guess it's both easy and hard. So on the one hand, one of the things that's wonderful about computer science, so in physics, there is a very sharp distinction between theoretical physics and experimental physics. Uh, you know, really, the, um, you know, the communities are hardly able to talk to each other and understand each other. That distinction doesn't exist, really, in computer science. I mean, for, yes, of course, you know, if someone is working in uh, machine learning and another person is working in complexity theory, they might have trouble interacting with each other. But, you know, for the most part, it's not because one is a theoretician and one is a practitioner. It's because they are in, you know, very deep in different subfields of, uh, of computer science. And so one of the things that I think is so important about computer science research is that uh, even for the most theoretical um, uh, researchers, our investigations typically are motivated by or informed by what goes on in the real world. And even for the most applied computer science researchers, uh, at least for the best of those researchers, there is both a facility and respect for the value of foundational advances in those applications. And so I always very quickly try, try to reject using the words basic or applied in front of computer science research. Because I, I really don't think for great researchers in, in our field that anyone is purely basic or purely applied. You know, we're all sort of you know, very kind of wide spectrum. And that is just a great great thing. Having said that, it was not easy to move from a university to government to, um, uh, to industry. And there are things that I found are better in each case, each move, but also things I miss. Um, so the joke, and so I will just maybe end with a joke about this. The joke that I uh, would make is the following. When I was the head of computer science at Carnegie Mellon, I had a big department of the smartest people, smartest faculty members and the smartest graduate students you could imagine. Um, and I had no authority, because in the university, no one listens to the department head. Uh, so very, first of all, almost no one respects the department head. And, uh, and then even if you respect the department, you don't listen to the department head. Um, when I went to DARPA, I had military authority, so absolute kind of people would literally salute to me in absolute respect. But in the military, the people were, I wouldn't say stupid, but they weren't like Carnegie Mellon uh, graduate students. And so even though I had all this authority, there was just, you couldn't use it on really great people. Um, and so now in, um, in industry, at Microsoft Research, a uh, vice president actually has a lot of authority. It's almost like military authority. Uh, and people listen very carefully, maybe too carefully to what I have to say, which is a problem because the smart people are the researchers, not the managers. Um, but what is strange now is that Microsoft research is in typical industry. I, it, I, there's this rule that I'm not supposed to tell people what to do. So even though I actually, in some sense, have this massive power, that I have the military authority that I had in DARPA, but with the set of smart people that I had at Carnegie Mellon, I'm not allowed to make use of it. And so, so the best I can do is come to places like this and give speeches. And that's the, uh, and so, so thanks for listening. Uh, Dana, thank you, Peter. I hope uh, it was an informative session. Yeah. I think we, Professor Anurag Kumar is already here, so we'll probably continue uh, with our next engagement. Thank you all for attending and staying. I hope thanks. you all enjoyed it. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available.